Welcome to Arts Express. This is Prairie Miller and on the show. In a six to three ruling, the Supreme Court strikes down a century old New York law that limited the carrying of concealed handguns outside the home. Good evening. The United States Supreme Court stripped away the nation's constitutional protections for abortion today. The decision by the court's conservative majority but first, overturned Roe v. Wade. The UK Wade. Home Secretary has approved the extradition of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to the United States, where he faces up to 175 years in prison if convicted of violating the Espionage Act. Hi, this is Jack Shalom. Given the current turn of events stemming from the recent rulings of the U.S. Supreme Court, and the rest of the world. We are happy to report that we have been in contact with Special Arts Express correspondent F. Kafka, who in response has traveled back to his hometown in Prague and brought forth a report he had written in 1915. Franz adds that his hobbies are writing, waiting in terror, and scurrying across the floor very quickly when heavy footsteps approach. Before the law sits a gatekeeper. To this gatekeeper comes a man from the country who asks to gain entry into the law. But the gatekeeper says that he cannot grant him entry at the moment. The man thinks about it and then asks if he will be allowed to come in later on. It is possible, says the gatekeeper, but not now. At the moment, the gate to the law stands open, as always, and the gatekeeper walks to the side. So the man bends over in order to see through the gate into the inside. When the gatekeeper notices that, he laughs and says, If it tempts you so much, try it in spite of my prohibition. But take note, I am powerful, and I am only the most lowly gatekeeper. But from room to room stand gatekeepers, each more powerful than the other. I can't endure even one glimpse of the third. The man from the country has not expected such difficulties. The law should always be accessible for everyone, he thinks. But as he now looks more closely at the gatekeeper in his fur coat, at his large pointed nose and his long, thin, black tartar's beard, he decides that it would be better to wait until he gets permission to go inside. The gatekeeper gives him a stool and allows him to sit down at the side in front of the gate. And there he sits for days and years. He makes many attempts to be let in, and he wears the gatekeeper out with his requests. The gatekeeper often interrogates him briefly, questioning him about his homeland and many other things, but they are indifferent questions, the kind great men put. And at the end, he always tells him once more that he cannot let him inside yet. The man, who has equipped himself with many things for his journey, spends everything, no matter how valuable, to win over the gatekeeper. The latter takes it all, but as he does so, says, I'm taking this only so that you do not think you have failed to do anything. (laughs) During the many years, the man observes the gatekeeper almost continuously. He forgets the other gatekeepers, and this one seems to him the only obstacle for entry into the law. 
He curses the unlucky circumstance. In the first years, thoughtlessly and out loud, later, as he grows old, he still mumbles to himself. He becomes childish, and since in the long years studying the gatekeeper, he has come to know the fleas in his fur collar. He even asks the fleas to help him persuade the gatekeeper. Finally, his eyesight grows weak and he does not know whether things are really darker around him or whether his eyes are merely deceiving him. But he recognizes now in the darkness an illumination which breaks inextinguishably out of the gateway to the law. Now he no longer has much time to live. Before his death, he gathers in his head all his experiences of the entire time into one question which he has not yet put to the gatekeeper. He waves to him, since he can no longer lift up his stiffening body. The gatekeeper has to bend way down to him, for the great difference has changed things to the disadvantage of the man. What do you still want to know, then, asks the gatekeeper. You are insatiable. Everyone strives after the law, says the man. So how is it that in these many years, no one except me has requested entry? The gatekeeper sees that the man is already dying, and in order to reach his diminishing sense of hearing, he shouts at him, Here no one else can gain entry, since this entry was assigned only to you. I'm now going to shut it. The UK Home Secretary has approved the extradition of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to the United States, where he faces up to 175 years in prison if convicted of violating the espionage. You've been listening to Before the Law by Franz Kafka. This is Jack Shalom for Arts Express with host Prairie Miller. And coming up next on the show... In other news, in the Arts Express Cancel Culture Uncancelled episode this week, who buried the arrest warrant for 67 years against Miss Roy Bryant, alias Carolyn Bryant Dunbar's, in the cellar of a Mississippi courthouse against the woman whose charges against 14-year-old Emmett Till of a black child daring to whistle at a white woman which led to his kidnapping, horrific torture, and lynching, and cover-up of a horrendous, racist crime that jolted the nation and the world. And with the Till family now demanding the arrest warrant against Brian, who is still alive, be served against her. Meanwhile, back in 1959, famed film and television screenwriter and playwright Rod Serling appeared on The Mike Wallace Show, describing how his attempt to present a TV drama about the tragedy of Emmett Till was censored and crushed into oblivion, and was what actually led him to create that historic show, The Twilight Zone, an alternative in the face of U.S. censorship and, well, the Twilight Zone of television in America, an alternative means for him to covertly connect social issues through science fiction and fantasy instead. Said Serling, the writer's role is to be a menacer of the public's conscience, and he must focus on the issues of his time. Have things changed much since then? Not likely. With its more contemporary manifestation, cancel culture very much alive and well today. 
Here's that Rod Serling interview with Mike Wallace back then. This is Mike Wallace with another television interview in our gallery of colorful people. In television drama, few names have the prestige of that of our guest. Rod Serling is the only writer to have won three Emmy Awards for Requiem for a Heavyweight, Patterns, The Comedian. We'll talk to him about censorship in television, his fight to say what he believes, and we'll learn what he means by the price tag that hangs on success. Way back in 1951, when television was just a baby, a young man sat in the Cincinnati diner with his wife and came to a momentous decision. He decided to give up the security of his job and take a chance in becoming a freelance television writer. Rod, first of all, let me ask you this. What was it that brought that decision about? Was it a burning desire to write because you felt that you had to say something, or was it just a way to make more money? The combination of many things, Mike. The immediate motive at the time, the prodding thing that pushed me into it, was that I'd been writing for a Cincinnati television station as a staff writer, uh -huh. which is a particularly dreamless occupation, composed of doing commercials, even making up uh, uh, letters of, uh, what do they call it, uh, to plug a product. Somebody has used it. Testimonial? Testimonial yeah. letters. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I, as I recall, there was a, uh, a drug, a liquid drug on the market at the time that uh, could cure everything from arthritis to a fractured pelvis. And I actually had to write testimonial letters. And on that particular day, I just had it. And though I had been freelancing concurrent with the staff job, the best year I'd ever had, I think we netted about $700, which is hardly even grocery money. Yeah. And that one night, we just decided to, you know, sink or swim and go into it. So you went, you came here to New York? Uh, not immediately. We stayed on six months, I guess, in Ohio, then came to New York. Uh, started principally in Lux Video Theater, then live in half hour emanating from New York. I did 11 shows for them, and I was sort of on my way from I that see. point on. And what kind of stuff did you write? Because you said that it wasn't just the money, it was something that you wanted to say that you weren't getting a chance to say in Cincinnati. Well, in those days, uh, Lux Video, as one show, was doing reasonably adult stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, these, of course, were not Playhouse 90s, nor were they award-winning shows, but they were reasonably mature things uh, that even today stand up pretty well. And uh, I was doing Lux Video, craft theater. The early so-called pioneer days of television, which, of course, are hardly pioneer, but anything over eight years old is pioneer style in television. You've come a long way since those early days. And perhaps more than any other writer, your name is figured in the classic battle of the, that is, television writer, uh, the battle of the writer to be his own man. What happens when a writer like yourself writes something that he really believes in for television? I I'm not sure I understand the question, Mike. What happens, you mean, in terms of... Well, we hear a lot about censorship of the writer on TV. We've oh, heard I a good deal it. about it in your own case, especially. Well, depending, of course, on the thematic treatment you're using, if you have the temerity to try to dramatize a theme that involves any particular social controversy currently extant, then you're in deep trouble. For instance? Uh, a racial theme, for example. My the case in point, I think, uh, a show I did for the Steel Hour some years ago, three years ago, called Noon on Doomsday, yeah. which was uh, a story which purported to tell what was the aftermath of the alleged kidnapping in Mississippi of the Till Boy, yeah. the young Chicago Negro. And I wrote the script using black and white uh, initially. Then it was changed uh, to suggest an unnamed foreigner. Then the locale was moved from the south to, the, to New England. And I'm convinced they'd have gone up to Alaska or the North Pole if, and using Eskimos as a possible minority, except I suppose the costume problem was of sufficient severity not to attempt it. But it became a lukewarm, vitiated, emasculated kind of show. You went along with it, though? All the way. I protested. I went down fighting, as most television writers do, yeah. thinking in a strange, oblique, philosophical way that better say something than nothing. In this particular show, though, by the time they had finished taking Coca-Cola bottles off the set because these sponsor claimed that this had southern connotations, suggesting to what depth they went to make this a clean antiseptically, rigidly uh, acceptable show. 
uh, why it bore no relationship at all to what we had purported to say in initially. Patty Chayefsky has talked about the insidious influence of what he calls pre-censorship. How does that work? Uh, pre-censorship is a practice, I think, of most television writers. I can't speak for all of them. This is the prior knowledge of the writer of those areas which are difficult to try to get through. And so a writer will shy away from writing those things which he knows he's going to have trouble with on a sponsorial or an agency level. We practice it all the time. We just do not write those themes which, you know are going, which we know are going to get into trouble. Who's the culprit? Is it the network, the FCC? No, it's certainly not the FCC, ideally speaking, of course. It's a combination of culprits in this case, Mike. It's partly network. It's principally agency and sponsor. In many ways, I think it's the audience themselves. How do you mean? Well, I'll give you an example. About a year ago, roughly 11 or 12 months ago, on the Lassie show, this is a story usually told by Sheldon Leonard, who was then associated with the show. Lassie was having puppies. And I have two little girls, then age five and three, who are greatly enamored of this beautiful collie. Mm -hmm. And they watched the show with great interest. And Lassie gave birth to puppies. And Mike, it was probably one of the most tasteful and delightful and warm things uh, depicting what is this, this, this wondrous thing that is birth. And after the show, I, I think there were many congratulations all around because it was a lovely show. The sort of thing I'd love my kids to watch to show them what is the birth process and how marvelous it is. They got many, many cards and letters. Sample card from the deep south this was. If I wanted my kids to watch sex shows, I wouldn't have had them turn on that. I could take them to burlesque shows. And as a result of the influx of mail, many of the cards, incidentally, as Sheldon tells it, were postmarked at identical moments, all in the same handwriting, but each was counted as a singular piece of mail. And as a result, the directive went down that there would be no shows having anything to do with puppies, that is, in the actual birth process. Well, obviously, it is this wild lunatic fringe of letter writers that, that greatly affect what the sponsor has in mind. You can understand the position of the sponsor, can't I, you? In, in many ways, I suppose I can. He's there to push a product. He has a considerable stake, thus, in what goes on the air. Most assuredly. And in those cases uh, where, we, where, there, where there is a, a problem of, of, of public taste, in which there is a concern for, for uh, eliciting negative response from a large mass of people, I can understand why the guys are frightened. Sure. I don't understand, Mike, for example, other evidences and instances of, of intrusion by sponsors. For example, on Playhouse 90, not a year ago, a lovely show called Judgment at Nuremberg. Uh, I think probably one of the most competently done and artistically done pieces that 90's done all year. In it, as you recall, uh, mention was made of gas chambers. Yeah. And the line was deleted, cut off the, cut off the, cut off the uh, soundtrack. And uh, it, ma it mattered little to these guys that the gas involved in concentration camps was cyanide, which bore no resemblance, physical or otherwise, to, to the gas used in stowed, they cut the line. Because the sponsor was... He did not want that awful association made between what was the horror and the misery of Nazi Germany with the nice, chrome, wonderfully antiseptically clean, beautiful kitchen appliances that they were selling. Yeah. Now, this is an, is an example of sponsor interference, which is so beyond logic and which is so beyond taste. This I rebel against. You've got a new series coming up called The Twilight Zone. You are writing as well as acting ex executive producer on this one. Who controls the final product? You are the sponsor. We have what I think, at least uh, theoretically anyway, because it hasn't really been put into practice yet, a good working relationship. We're in questions of taste, in questions of the art form itself, in questions of drama. I'm the judge, because this is my medium and I understand it. I'm a dramatist for television. This is the area I know. I've been trained for it. I've worked for it for 12, in it for 12 years. And the sponsor knows his product, but he doesn't know mine. So when it comes to the commercials, I leave that up to him. When it comes to the story content, he leaves it up to me. Has nothing been changed in the... We changed in 18 scripts, Mike. We have had one line changed, which again was a little ludicrous, but of, of insufficient basic uh, uh, concern within the context of the story, not, not to put up a fight. Uh, on a bridge of a British ship, a sailor calls down to the galley and asks in my script for a pot of tea because I believe that it's constitutionally acceptable in the British Navy to drink tea. Yeah. Uh, my, one of my sponsors happens to sell instant coffee, and he took great umbrage, or at least minor umbrage anyway, yeah. with the idea of uh, saying tea. Well, we had a couple of swings back and forth, nothing serious, and we decided we'd ask 
for a tray to be sent up to the bridge. <laughs> but in 18 scripts, that's the only conflict we've had. Well, they've it, passed. They've passed what? I mean, every script. Is pre-censorship, though, involved? Are you simply writing easy? In this particular area, no, because we're dealing with a half-hour show, which cannot probe like a 90, which doesn't use scripts as vehicles of social criticism. These are strictly for entertainment. These are pot boilers. Oh, no. Uh -uh. I wouldn't then, call them pot boilers at all. No, these are very adult, uh, I think, high-quality, half-hour, extremely polished films. But because they deal in the areas of fantasy and imagination and science fiction and all, all of those things, uh, there's no opportunity to cop a plea or, or chop an axe or anything. Well, you're not going to be able to cop a plea or chop an axe because you're going to be obviously working so hard on the Twilight Zone that, in essence, for the time being and for the foreseeable future, you've given up on writing anything important for television, right? Yeah. For the, well, uh, again, this is a semantic thing, important for television. I don't know. If by important you mean I'm not going to try to delve into current social problems dramatically, you're quite right. I'm not. You told Kay Gardella of the New York Daily News this. You said, professionally, I don't think Twilight Zone will hurt me, but I must admit I don't think it'll help me either. I'm stepping out of the line of fire. You've had it as far as trying to beat your brains out. Would you just read me the first two lines, Mike? Professionally, I don't think Twilight Zone will hurt me, but I must admit I don't think it'll help me. I either. never said that. I'm convinced it'll help me. I have great pride in this show. In 11 or 12 years of writing, Mike, I can lay claim to at least this. I have never written beneath myself. I've never written anything that I didn't want my name attached to. Mm -hmm. I have probed deeper in some scripts, and I've been more successful in some than others. But all of them that have been on, you know, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take my lick. I, I, they're mine, and that's the way I wanted them. Uh, somebody asked me the other day if this means that uh, uh, I'm going to be a, a, uh, a meek conformist. And I, my answer is no. I'm just acting the role of a tired nonconformist. <laughs> And I don't want to. I don't want to fight anymore. Uh, I don't want to have. Wanna fight anymore. I don't want to have to battle sponsors and agencies. I don't want to have to push for something that I want and have to settle for second best. I don't want to have to compromise all the time, which in essence is what the television writer does if he wants to put on controversial themes. Well, then why do you stay in television? I stay in television because I think it's very possible to perform a, a function of providing adult, meaningful, exciting challenging drama without dealing in controversy necessarily. This, of course, Mike, is not the best of all possible worlds. I am not suggesting that th this is at the absolute millennium. I think it's criminal that we're not permitted to make dramatic note uh, of, of social evils as they exist, of controversial themes as yeah. they are, are, are inherent in our society. I, I think it's ridiculous that drama, which by its very nature should make a comment and those things that affect our daily lives is in, the, is in the position, at least in terms of television drama, of not being able to take, these, to take this stand. But this is the, these are the facts of life. This is the way it exists. And they can't look to me or Shayevsky or Rose or Gorby Dahl or J.P. Miller or any of these guys as the, as the uh, precipitators of the big change. It's not for us to do it. Let of course, us got out of television. Yeah, he did. And I, I, don't, I can't knock that. I think this takes a relative degree of guts to leave a medium that's made you, that's made you as sociable as a kind of a household name. Patty was the first guy to kind of lend stature to the television writer. Uh, prior to Patty Shayevsky, most of us were considered to be two-headed hacks who worked around the clock and used boy-girl situations in any one of 5,000 different routine manners. But Patty gave us a stature. And I respect Patty's decision to leave. He felt that he wasn't satisfied with doing things half best. Do you, think, do you think you could make it outside of television? Me? Yeah. I'm not sure I could. And I suppose this is an admission of a kind of weakness or at least a sense of insecurity on my part. I've never had a Broadway play produced. What few motion pictures I've written have been somewhat less than spectacular. And I suppose I stay in the medium partly as an admission of uh, I, I want to I stay in the womb. This is the medium I understand. These are the tools and techniques that I've been versed in for many years. Huh. Maybe I don't want to, you know, get stuck up on the board and get shot out with darts in a Broadway play when I'm not sure I'm prepared for it. But Patty was willing to take the chance. Gore Vidal writes novels. Bob Arthur did Broadway. What about you and novels? Ultimately, I'd love to write a novel, and I think next year I'll start my play. Requiem was uh, under option. I was, it was written as a play, and I gave them their money back, and I want to do it over again. But I stay in the medium also because I happen to like the medium. Herb Brodkin, who was a TV producer who was associated with some of your earlier plays, has said this about you. He said, Rod is either going to stay commercial or become a discerning artist, but not both. I remember the quote. Uh, he got, uh, 
He got it. He gave it to Gilbert Milstein when Milstein was doing a profile on me in the New York Times. I didn't understand it at the time. I, I failed to achieve any degree of understanding in the ensuing years, which are three in number. If I, I presume uh, Herb means that inherently you cannot be commercial and artistic. You cannot be commercial and quality. You cannot be commercial concurrent with having a, a preoccupation with the level of storytelling that you want to achieve. And this I have to reject. I think you can be, I don't think calling something commercial tags it with a kind of an odious suggestion that it stinks, that it's something raunchy to be ashamed of. I don't think uh, if you say commercial means to be publicly acceptable, what's wrong with that? As long, the, the, the essence of my argument, Mike, is that as long as you are not ashamed of anything you write, be, if you're a writer, as long as you're not ashamed of anything you perform if you're an actor, and I'm not ashamed of doing a television series, I could have, right, I could have done probably 30 or 40 film series over the past five years. I, I presume at least I've turned down that many mm -hmm. with, uh, with great guarantees of cash, with great guarantees of, of financial security, but I've turned them down because I didn't like them. I did not think they were quality, and God knows they were commercial. Uh, but I think uh, innate in what Herb says is this suggestion made by many people that you can't have public acceptance and still be artistic. And I, as I say, I have to reject that. One of your most recent plays was one called The Velvet Alley, right? Right. It was about the corrupting influences of Hollywood and big money. Right. Where'd that come from, your own experiences? Many, part of it was very autobiographical. Part of it was a composite of, other, of, of observation of other people involved. Well, what do you mean by the corrupting influence of Hollywood and big money? What is that? What, well, what were I you didn't, saying? I didn't mean to suggest that, that corruption had a geographical tag, that it was necessarily no. the corruption of Hollywood. What I tried to suggest dra dramatically was that when you get into the big money, particularly in the kind of detonating, exciting, explosive, overnight way that our industry permits, there are certain blandishments that a guy can succumb to, and many do. Such as? Uh, a preoccupation with status, with the symbols of status, with the heated swimming pool that's 10 feet longer than the neighbors, with the big car, with the concern about billing, uh, all these things. In a sense, rather minute things, really, in context, but th that become disproportionately large in a guy's mind. And also, because those become so large, what becomes small? I think probably the really valuable things. And I know this sounds corny and, and no. sort of buckwheatish to say that things like having a family, being concerned with raising children, being concerned with where they go to school, being concerned with a good marital relationship, all these things, I think, are of the essence. Uh, unfortunately, and the problem, as I tried to dramatize in The Velvet Alley, was that the guy who makes a success is immediately assailed by everybody. And you suddenly find yourself having to compromise along the line, giving so many hours to work and a disproportionate number of fewer hours to family. Yeah. And this is inherent in our business. How many hours a day do you work right now as executive producer and or writer on? 12 to 14 hours a day. How many days a week? Seven. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't mean now, seriously, I'm not asking for figures here, but obviously, the Twilight Zone is your own creation. You're doing it for money. I think that our audience would be fascinated to know. And again, I, I, I don't want to get too specific, but uh, how rich can a fellow get under these circumstances? Well, if the show is successful, he can get tremendously rich. He can make a half a million dollars, I suppose. Half a million dollars of what? A year? Uh, over a period of three or four years, I suppose, yeah. But, Mike, I, I'm not, th again, this sounds defensive and it probably sounds phony, but I'm not nearly as concerned with the money to be made on this show as I am with the quality of it, and I can prove that. Uh, I have a contract with Metro Goldwyn Mayer which guarantees me something in the neighborhood of a quarter of a million dollars over a period of three years. This is a contract I'm trying to break and get out of so I can devote time to a series which is very iffy, which is a very problematical thing. It's only guaranteed 26 weeks, and if it only goes 26 weeks and stops, I'll have lost a great deal of money. But I would rather take the chance and do something I like, something I'm familiar with, something that has a built-in challenge to it. It's even possible, though, that if it is a success, you could make well over the $2 million that you suggested right. four and years, I, a half a million apiece. Quite right, but I happen to feel after a year and a half of working 12 to 14 hours a day, it's worth it. And I think I rate it. I think anybody does who works that hard and can create an idea. 
and can and can uh, make a show go. Thirty seconds. Is television good? Some television's wonderful. Some television is exciting and promising and has vast potential. Some media, some television is mediocre and bad. But uh, I think it has promise, Mike. I think this is can conceivably be a real art form, and I stick with it for the reasons I said and because I think that. Uh, it can only improve, and can improve tremendously, and I think aims toward that. Rod Serling's story can be summed up in just a few words. From 40 rejection slips, to three Emmy Awards, from a trailer home to a hacienda in Hollywood complete with swimming pool, it hasn't been a long road, but it's been a hard one, and the last couple of miles have been paved with gold. We thank Rod Serling for adding his portrait to our gallery, one of the people other people are interested in. Mike Wallace, that's it for now. And now on Arts Express, apparently the racist police murder of George Floyd in 2020 didn't stop there. The arrest of cop Derek Chauvin on those charges actually led to racism in the jail itself, where he was initially incarcerated. Guards of color there at that Minnesota Ramsey County Jail have filed a racial discrimination lawsuit still pending, charging that they were barred or reassigned from that floor, detaining Chauvin by a white lieutenant solely based on their race. And that incident is now the subject of a docudrama, Terence Tykeem's When George Got Murdered, and our guest on the show is actor and TV talk show host Montel Williams, who stars in the film as an exasperated officer at that jail who is powerless to deal with the situation. First, some scenes from When George Got Murdered, then Montel Williams, and the writer-director Terence Tykeem joining in later during the conversation. And if this is about George Floyd's killer being in jail, I don't have nothing to say. The guards of color were somehow banned from the floor where Derek Chauvin, who is white, was being held. It's making me angry in hell that they decided to send that Chauvin down here to this jail. Chaos filled Minneapolis streets for a fourth night. Not even 8 o'clock curfew could prevent it. We've never had an ex-cop being held in our prison who happened to suffocate the life out of a handcuffed man for eight minutes and 46 seconds on camera for the whole damn world to see. Hey, Chauvin. Chauvin. Man, this cop sure picked a hell of a time to set the world on fire. You might want to tell the word in it now. The media has gotten word that none of the black guards, not one, is being allowed to work the block where Chauvin is being held. Damn. Man, I can't believe they got this clown on the same block as us, man. This is C.O. Jordan. I won't even turn a bank to work at the facility until this is addressed in one form or another. But the way they killed that man got everybody traumatized. You've seen it. This man was murdered by police. How many times we got to see that man get killed? Are you still wearing your uniform when you're not going to work today? I believe I was, but I changed my mind. I will never forget where I was when that man George got murdered. Babe, it could have been me. I'm gonna burn this whole city down. Hello, Montel Williams, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Now, what led you to the subject of this film and to come on board as the star? I, I, I like everyone else in this country, is, is deeply involved in thinking about the George Floyd murder when it happened. So I, I didn't. I, I was. I literally got involved in this film when Terrence, who's the director, reached out and asked me to do a role for him. So. Um, that, that's what, what uh, led me to the film, and that's how I got involved. And at the heart of this film is asking the question, where were you when George Floyd was murdered? So where were you then? 
I was uh, traveling. Um, I didn't see the video clip until uh, later on that day. So I was appalled. I think most people saw it before I got to see it. And I, I was as appalled as the rest of the world was. Now, ironically, the racism of this case was followed by racism against the officers of color in the jail following Chauvin's arrest and their segregation from his floor. Why was it important for you to tell their story as well and any related interviews and research? Um, I, I believe, you know, when Terrence reached out and said that he was, he was going to present this material in a little bit of a different way, and I got an opportunity to read the script, I thought um, it was very interesting the way he was approaching it because a lot of people didn't know that some of the officers, the corrections officers in the jail where Chauvin was held had been taken off their uh, normal, I don't know what they call it in there, uh, off their normal area that they worked in because they were not being allowed to be around Chauvin, just basically on the color of their skin. And so I thought the take was very interesting and I thought it was information that needed to be presented. Then I was happy to be able to play the role that I played because it literally is a role that allowed me to, to or allowed us to kind of show the desperate position they were putting almost everybody in, in a way to protect Chauvin. And then I think, you know, when you look at the comments and the way the scripts un unfolds, it was just a really, really good way to just to, to tackle that topic and let people understand that the racism didn't just stop with George Floyd's death, but it perpetuated and continues as it continues today. And do you know what has been the result of those officers' racial discrimination lawsuit? I, we don't. I believe that there's been a lot of lawsuits filed, and just like the other cases with the other officers that, other than Chauvin, there's been postponement, 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 this thing is pushed out until early next year, so I don't believe it's been adjudicated yet. And why do you feel it's important that people see this movie? Um, I just think it's important because it, it can continue the conversation, uh, conversations that we refuse to have, yet we watch the, you know, it's just like the conversations we refuse to have around gun violence. We just don't have them. Uh, though people, you know, do their obligatory, my blessings go out to people, you know, we still have, you know, I believe since the, um, the elementary school shooting, there's been probably something like 150 plus deaths in America because of gun violence. So, you know, these are conversations that should be had and should continue to be had until we figure out some solutions. And was there anything in your own life personally around racism that led you to this film? My, I'm, I'm, I'm a 65 year old man who's an African American in this country. My entire life has been, you know, uh, in some way, shape, or form played out in the context of racism in America from day one. So, I mean, there's nothing in particular, you know, I, right now you, you, you have to really consciously make an effort to walk outside the door that you live in because, you know, walking while black is now a crime in this country. Going to church while black is a crime in this country. Driving while black is a crime in this country. Speaking while black is a crime in this country. So there isn't one racist incident that you know, stands out above any other. I mean, uh, I've been through so many in my life that I could not even literally go back and try to tap into one or two of them. I would just say that it's the natural, it's the experience that America has, and it's an experience that we need to either start talking about and say, and not just say, but try to do something about it or knock off the conversation and just admit that we are as racist as we are and leave it at that. And how have you faced the challenges of racism in the entertainment world? Well, I mean, I, I think the challenge is, is there for anyone who's a person of color who lives in this country, and that is, you know, make sure that you figure out a way to define who you are rather than let someone else define you and you live up to your own expectations and not down to someone else's, and then try your best to stay alive. I mean, you know, it's very clear. You can be sitting in a, a church pew. You can be walking down an aisle of a grocery store. You can be standing out on a street corner. If the color of your skin is black, you have a target on your on your back. And, you know, I think uh, vigilance is probably one of the greatest tools that I have. My, my experience in the military and my experience in life has forced me to, you know, walk into a room and always find the exit sign before I sit down. Walk into a room and scope out a place that might be protected before I sit down. Um, you know, it's it's survival. And that's what we have to figure out a way to do. And what's up for you next? Uh, I am, I've been working on projects. Uh, I, I literally do a show 
uh, I just finished one that's um, called Military Makeover, where we go in and take the homes of deserving veterans and we basically make them over from the ground up. We do one of those a quarter. I just finished filming one of those in Michigan City, Indiana, and um, I work on several other television projects. One's called Competitive Edge, and so I am constantly doing that, but I'm also speaking around the country. I'm speaking in Hawaii at a forum for AMBETS. So um, I'm continuing my advocacy for various things from post-traumatic stress to cannabis around the country. And just joining us is the film's writer-director, Terrence Taikim. So any last word from each of you on when George got murdered? Well, um, I mean, this, I mean, this film clearly um, keeps the conversation going. My whole thing right now is to try to keep the conversation going because, like, because, like, my and I said, we, you know, like timing wise, we, 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 we didn't, the, the, we missed the boat in terms of the timing wise of for it to be for the film to be able to hit as hard as we as it possibly could have hit, and uh, and and the fact that people are 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 becoming uh, more and more desensitized somebody taking someone's life i mean you know i mean i mean the, i mean you have people on on social media and in the public making making excuses for somebody killing somebody saying somebody's job the job they do is more important than somebody's life so i mean you know you know when you have that kind of stuff it, it it's crazy so the good thing about this film is that it, it's keeping the conversation going it's keeping the issue out out front because there's just a this is a just a matter of time before there's another huge one of these incidents on 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 television and social media, social media. Yeah. yeah I, I wonder, you know, Terrence. I think though, when Terrence says it's only a matter of time before there's another huge one of these, I'm not sure that the issue will ever rise to this level of attention again. I, I personally believe that mm -hmm. George Floyd happened when it happened. The media descended upon it, but since then there have been 1,127 other police killings recorded in, in 2020 alone. And only 16 of those cases, as 1.4% of those cases, resulted in a charge against the, the, the offending officer. So, you know, we're looking at something that, yes, made a big difference singularly. But since then, now it's just something that we just keep kicking under the rug because we really don't care. It's just like, you know, the world, the nation came to a standstill you know, over the Uvalde elementary school shooting, but then there was a shooting right outside of, or a guy arrested right outside of a daycare center, a shooting in a hospital. Yeah. Didn't get the same news attention. There's been some, you know, I don't know, since Uvalde, there's been probably close to 100 more shootings in America and deaths by guns, and we don't even talk about them. So I think the George Floyd murder was a singular event that the world stood still for. But now the world has moved on from. Right. You've got, you got Ukraine and other things that people are more interested in right now. So it's unfortunate, but I'm hoping that uh, you know, as Terrence continues to screen the movie and continues to do press, and maybe the conversations will continue. Yeah. Okay, thank you both of you for calling into the show. Thank you so much. Thanks okay. a lot. And When George Got Murdered is out now in release. And we'll go out now with Bro on the Global Film Beat. Meet Juan Guaido, Frank Capra's 1941 populist comedy, Meet John Doe, rerun as Imperial Farce. And that self-proclaimed Venezuelan president and U.S. puppet who, quote, simply hides behind what for Capra were the forces of an ever-growing threat of corporate media fascism. <laughs> América Latina obrera, ¿por qué no lo haces? El yanqui teme a la revolución. El yanqui teme grito, yanqui gojón, yanqui gojón. This is Bro on the Global Film Beat, Breaking Glass. Today's episode, Meet Juan Guaido, Capra's Depression-era comedy replayed as imperial farce. In 1941, Frank Capra directed Meet John Doe, the last of his Depression-era populist trilogy, extolling the virtues of the common man and woman. 
In this film, Gary Cooper, a down-on-his-luck hobo, gets chosen by a newspaper magnate as the ultimate symbol of an America still ravaged by the economic failure of the stock market crash. The eponymous everyman, John Doe, and reality a broken-down Bush League pitcher named John Willoughby, is built up by the popular media of his day, big city newspapers and radio stations, to unite the country in a wave of fellow feeling that magically puts people back to work and cures social malaise. Behind Doe, though, stands the nefarious forces of media magnates wanting to rule the country, along with bought-off politicians and greedy financiers in a legion of black-suited men holding a Madison Square Garden rally with all the traces of Hitler's famed Nuremberg lighting, and with the publisher even in command of his own personal militia. That scenario was replayed a few years ago, as the U.S. with its own brand of newspaper magnates, military personnel, and slinky Trump-era statesmen like the CIA State Department's Mike Pompeo, Anointed from nowhere and utterly out of the blue, their Latin American John Doe, Juan Guaido, and one of their repeated attempts to overthrow the elected head of the Venezuelan state, Nicolas Maduro. Elected head of the rival National Assembly in January 2019, Guaido, barely known in the country outside political circles, then announced himself president and was quickly recognized by the U.S., Canada, and the EU. Just as in Capra's fable, this John Doe was built up by the corporate media, and particularly by the financial press, which quickly took an unknown and made him into a hero of the people. And being named one of its 100 most interesting people of 2019, Time magazine extolled the virtues of a leader who was young, energetic, articulate, determined, and possessed with the mother of all virtues, courage. The Wall Street Journal quoted a Jesuit priest who claimed this hand-picked man of the people Looks like he belongs in the barrio. While Bloomberg Financial News hailed him as someone who is engaged in building unity. In Capra's film, John Doe struggles mightily to live up to the image that is created for him by the media, eventually beginning to believe he is the common man so fed up with his despondent situation that he will commit suicide on Christmas Eve, but who then believes in communitarian goodwill. But as a whale as John Doe has also struggled to maintain the image the U.S. press has created for him. Four short months after he declared himself president, Guaido called for an insurrection against Maduro, which was unsuccessful, as the military and those in the barrios have repeatedly backed Maduro, contrary to the testimony of WSJ's Jesuit. Two months later, Guaido's representatives in right-wing Colombia were accused of embezzling up to $60,000, supposedly to pay for soldiers defecting from Venezuela, but, so the accusations say, instead spent on parties and nightclubs. Worse yet, that September, a coup attempt, again originating from Colombia, led by two American Special Forces agents who wanted in return for a successful takeover, $213 million from Venezuela's future oil revenues, and which envisioned Maduro carted off to a U.S. jail, where he would face a Noriega-style trial, ended with the coup squelched and the two Americans in jail. The plotters called it Operation Freedom but the press quickly dubbed the coup, planned by a former Trump security guard, the Bay of Piglets, referring to a failed CIA invasion of Cuba. As to Guaido's vaunted courage, after his failed call for an uprising, the Venezuelan foreign minister accused him of hiding out in the French embassy. Barbara Stanwyck's journalist, who helped, helps create the John Doe myth, succumbs at one point in the film to the rewards offered to a press mercenary by the paper's owner, played by post-oppression evil capitalist supreme Edward Arnold, rotund and quaking with a seething lust for power. Stanwyck's newspaper woman parades around in her new fur coat, is dazzled by a jeweled necklace, and looks to be in line to marry the publisher's nephew, thus sealing the deal. Venezuela's Juan Guaido has also attempted to cash in on his newfound fame. The U.S. has handed control of Venezuela's bank accounts in the U.S. to Guaido claiming that this theft of the money from Venezuela's oil revenues, which the country is in desperate need of, would, quote, benefit the Venezuelan people. In the U.K., Guaido is now closing in on being the recipient of the country's $1.68 billion gold reserve, though at this moment he is now not only not the president, but in a power contest to even be head of the assembly. Last year, the 27 countries of the EU voted to no longer recognize him as the president of Venezuela, and his support in the country now stands at a dismal 16%. In Capra's fable, the Stanwyck and Cooper characters come together, aided by various John Does across the country, to avert what is presented in visual terms as a fascist takeover by the power-hungry publisher, and people begin to believe in John Doe, though they now know his story. Latin American John Doe has a different ending. 
The U.S. and U.K. continue to cling to the now globally discredited myth of the freedom fighter, his country at first never knew, and which now regards him as corrupt. At last week's Summit of the Americas, the Juan Guaido myth was still being affirmed by Joe Biden and his Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. The summit was boycotted by Mexico, Bolivia, Honduras, and Guatemala, largely because Biden refused to invite Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, countries he claims are not democratic, but who instead have had the audacity to elect leaders the U.S. disfavors. Instead, we were treated to the spectacle of a U.S.-backed puppet, a self-proclaimed president with almost no popular support, a John Doe who, unlike Capra's crusader who ultimately sees the light, simply hides behind what for Capra were the forces of an ever-growing threat of corporate fascism. This is the second in Dennis Bro's trilogy in honor of Capra's films. The first was Mr. Zelensky Goes to Washington about a phony populist. The third is the upcoming Mr. Caruso Goes to Town about a Republican developer turned California man of the people. And this is Bro on the global film beat, Breaking Glass. Thank you, Dennis Bro, and the late Venezuelan music legend Ali Primera, who is honored in Venezuela as belonging to the national musical heritage of that country. And that's all we have time for today on Arts Express, Expression in the Arts. And if you'd like to express yourself too, you can write to us at theradiogoddess at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Prairie Miller leaving the station. Y viene remontando el Amazonas, el grito rebelde del Carioca, y viene a unirse con su hermano, el obrero venezolano. América Latina obrera, América Latina obrera, América Latina. Levanten tus manos la bandera de la revolución, América Latina obrera y grite con fuerza, Yankee Go Home, Yankee Go Home, Yankee Go Los obreros de América Latina te dicen Gringo, go home Yankee, go home Levanten tus manos la bandera de la revolución América Latina obrera y gris 